Today we're going to talk a little bit about fencing. So starting off with your basic fence, what's the purpose? So holding in goats, sheep, cows, pigs. Pigs may be a little bit more um, intensive on fences if you're not using electrical, but the standard woven wire, pretty straightforward. Now what are you keeping out? That's another question. So if you're keeping out uh, coyotes, very common across the west. Um, I've heard they're moving into the east coast um, seaboard area now, so that's that's pretty extensive uh, problem for farmers in the U.S. Are we keeping out wolves? There's some areas where that's relevant. Wolves can jump higher than coyotes and they are very physically impressive animals. In our particular case, we're trying to keep out deer. So this fence behind me, you can see going down uh, the hillside, coming up the hillside, um, up to there. So that particular fence is about six to six and a half feet tall. Um, in some places it's as high as seven and it's on a slant. So it's got about a 15 degree uh, angle off of vertical, maybe maybe as much as 20, with the idea being deer are not supposed to want to jump the extra distance. They're willing to jump high, but not far. Well, it turns out that uh, depends on your definition of far. <laughs> so we had uh, deer in the orchard um, about five, six days ago now. And right over here, See if I can get my fingers in the right place. Right over here. There we go. In this area, towards the top, uh, but not quite at the top fence is where they came. So they came from this uh, forest that's up here past this uh, crab apple. They came down the hillside there. And then uh, the fence that goes that way um, they didn't jump that. That's eight feet. That's uh, always been intended to be uh, a diversion fence to divert them away from the orchard. And the plan had been, when we got the cache, to finish out all the way following that same line that you can see um, kind of right there, just down the hillside here following this line until you get to way down there at the neighbor's fence line. Um, there, hard to figure out where to, <laughs> where to point. So that being said, fence is expensive. Woven wire fences, a uh, good chunk of that. And the posts to hold woven wire fence are also a little more uh, intensive and expensive. And, and you need more of them. You need more of them and you need more metal posts than you do when you're putting up an electric fence. Um, electric fences on the flat, you can go quite a ways between posts and they, obviously there's not much weight there. So you just get it uh, tension the wire a little tighter and it, it'll do the job. So let's take a peek down here. And I'll just show you that spacing if you can see it. Uh, maybe you can't. So looking down there, there is an electric fence yeah, you can't see that. Well, let's just look up here. Over here is an electric fence. So this is 20 feet for most of those posts and that's going through kind of a rough terrain section. So the woven wire, I typically do about 20 wire spacings. You can go farther than that. You can depends on what you're holding in or holding out. So cattle, if you don't have electric up, will rub the fence. Horses will rub the fence. Um, goats will rub the fence. Uh, so my preference is to have a strong fence and electric wire and make absolutely, sh absolutely sure that my animals aren't gonna get into the orchard. And obviously with the height we need, that's the, that's the change. So deer will not jump a fence that is eight feet high. That requires 10 foot posts and is a super pain in the back side. So that's what we're working on right now. So things in common between woven and other fence solutions, how you build your corners or the ends. Um, 
that's important. So you can see behind me here, I've got three posts with bracers. And this is a, a slight angle in the fence line. So it comes down from that upper fence and then has a, a turn, it's not 90, it's, it's very slight. Right, let's see if we can do that, more like that. Uh, maybe, again, like 10, 15 degrees, but it's enough that I wouldn't want to rely on metal T-posts to hold a tight fence. Plus, this gives it something to hold up the line. So right here, you can kind of see probably that there's a sharp slope headed down the hill. Um, that, that turning point is going to create a lot of downward stress on whatever posts are right at that junction. So that's what this is for. At the ends, you would have typically a two post setup. And uh, we have that down here. I'll just, I'll walk down there with you real quick so you can see it. But at the end, you have that two post setup that uh, has a bracer board as well as a wrap wire, which I'll show you down here. We just haven't done that part yet. I'm about to do that on those three back up that hill. And that wrap wire provides a counter um, force uh, to balance out the fact that you don't also have a bracer board on the bottom. You, I guess you could do a bracer board on the bottom, but the wire is actually pretty great because it also pulls the posts together. So let me show you here. So here is an example of what I'm talking about. So here's two posts. You can see that board. And then you can see that there is a wire that wraps the two posts with, I'm using just an old piece of, of metal. It's, it's quite sturdy uh, metal um, pipe. Um, and it, it's quite sturdy. So what you do is you wrap the, the post from that side, let's see if I can do a better job than that, from this post on the tall part of the post, right at roughly where the crossbeam is. You wanna wrap a little at or above the crossbeam, and then on the other side, the other post, so you, you wanna wrap that at the bottom, a couple inches above the bottom. So what does that do? Well, the pull of the fence is going to be wanting to bring the two ends together because the fence is going to be really pulled tight. Um, that, and that, that gets a nice um, nice pressure on it, a nice, helps it stand up and hold up against animals. And so you want to get it tight, but that creates force on both ends towards the middle as the wire is pulled tight um, against those posts. So you, you have to have the cross beam and you also want to have that counterbalance that pulls because in this setup, this top board or this post here versus that post there, um, this post is going to take pressure to fold on the top that way. So you have that wire to the bottom that pulls downward toward that bottom to prevent the two posts from uh, moving through that that way so you you have that set up and then you run over that with woven wire and I've already done the bottom I haven't yet built it in with uh, the top wires there's no top wire on this section of fence but you can see that the fence is already around there so how do you build that stage of the fencing you want to staple in have it be vertically level along one of the, the joint lines in the wire. You wanna staple in at one of your corners or one of your, your ends of your fence into the, the T post or into the, the wooden posts. When that's stapled in, then you go to the other end and you take a tool like this here. Let me see if I can get it stood up for you. So this guy is a fence puller and you can see it's got uh, hooks and it's got a pull uh, circle at the back and a, a bar. And you get that pulled on the roll of fencing. When the fencing is laid out, you wanna tie off to maybe your tractor or something. Then you have something like this, which is just a, a pull winch. 
that takes up to uh, that's a four thousand pound. That's plenty for most of what I'm doing. My fences aren't very long, um, fence sections. And then uh, you tighten that down, and that brings the fence up and it brings it in. Then you would staple it carefully because you're under a lot of pressure, so you don't want to over tighten. And if you have done fencing, you know this very well. Your pull, your pulley may break, the wire may break, and then you're going to have something flying somewhere, and probably you're going to be the the spot where it stops flying. So, caution. If you don't have a strong familiarity with th when things break, which let's be real here, you should. It's fun. But if you don't then be very cautious when making a, uh, this, part, this part of the fence project. So you want to get that stapled off and uh, you want to do that very carefully. So let me show you the, the wire and what I do. So with this roll, you can see that there's a top wire and then there's wires going down. You can cut the vertical wires when you're doing this work, uh, preparing to staple at the very end but you cannot cut all, obviously, if you think about it, all of the horizontal wires. Otherwise, there's nothing holding in place. So never cut the top two until last or the bottom two. And then obviously you wanna cut one bottom and one top and get all of that stapled in. I leave the top and the very bottom as my last two that I work on. And once you get that, because and, and of course the pressure is going to release when you get down to those last two wires and cut that, that first of those last two wires, the majority of the pressure will, will release, but there's still, there's still some kick in there, even for that last wire. So be very careful with that. Position yourself to where you're not going to get hit by something flying. Obviously don't be straddling your chain and pulley or something like that, um, unless you've already had kids and you want to be done with that so yeah so that's that's the key components of a, a fence and building a fence there's some parts and pieces for the uh, top wires that I really like I'm running electrical so if an animal is gonna test it out before trying to jump um, they'll get a shock and then additionally to that uh, you know just having a barrier up there so that they don't want to try and jump through that barrier so there's a part up here that I really like. They're an eye hook. Let's see if you can see that there. You can, uh, there's a chuck for a, a drill bit, basically. A, a chuck that fits around that, that um, will drive that into your wooden posts. And those way better than your standard yellow or black nail-in insulators. So highly recommend those. They're well built and they they hold even when you put some pressure on your electrical line, which I like to put a little pressure, not a lot, but some, to get it uh, tighter. So the setup I have here at these top posts, um, they're pretty tall, and this allows me to drive my tractor through. So there's a gate between this po wooden post here and this metal post here, there's gonna be a gate. And then there's gonna be a gate um, between that same wooden post and the one behind me here. So I have a, a, a run. The animals can go the breadth of up and down the property from the barn, and I let them into each of the paddocks along the way as a rotational system. And I like to keep everything electrified all the time. That helps discourage animals that might get in through the perimeter fence uh, from going further. Um, and it, it will also at least encourage them to jump over the fence versus just walking right through it and breaking it. And then you have to do the repair all the time. So, yeah, that's, that's how we do our fence lines around here. The only other little tidbit that I have, um, that's a, a personal preference kind of, but it's the way I do it and the way I was taught. Uh, there is a particular number and spacing of these wire clips that hold the, the, the fence to the T-post. So I do the top, I skip one, I go down, I skip one, I go down, and there's nothing in here yet, and I skip one and go down, and then the bottom, I put the last two, I put both of those, put both of the those as a clipped um, line. 
So that's that's how I do it, and uh, it produces a very sturdy fence. Um, probably not something I should necessarily be doing, but uh, if I have to climb over a fence that's not electrified, it holds up well even to my 200 pounds um, with that kind of a clip system and, and good good tightness and doesn't damage the fence. So yeah, so that's uh, that's what we're working on right now, getting that deer, anti-deer fence installed and getting that uh, run through this whole section. So the hope is that when we're done here, with this line going all the way down to the neighbor's property um, uh, along that stretch there heading towards those greenhouses. There's a cross fence that goes the length over to the road. The deer, I think, are coming from this forest behind me, coming over to the hillside, finding the weak spot in the fence, jumping it, and then getting into the orchard. So if that entire run happens to be um, done from top to bottom, with this tall fence hopefully they don't keep trying to find a way around but if if they do i do intend eventually to run um further fence heightening programs so there's already some work that needs done down there at the corner with the road let's see if i can find it about there yeah under those trees essentially corners off to the road right in there so I already intend to go to that, that point and uh, replace one of the corner sets because the, the main post is rotted away and it's not that fence isn't keeping tightness anymore. That would also be where we'd have to go in um, with a um, driveway for the orchard stand when we put one in. That's roughly where it's going to be. So it makes sense to just get all that done and try and get that done probably later this year or early next year and that will put us in a great spot to have uh, that whole line run along their property as a tall fence i don't think i'm going to run it electrical i'll run it with a few more wires and have that whole whole fence line be um, heavier gauge a few more tall posts that are wood instead of t-posts and then I can, I can grow climbers on it and help provide them with a little bit of privacy if they're okay with that, if that's something that they would like. Um, I think that's, that's just a nice thing to do for your neighbors um, since there'll be people in the orchard and that's, you know, they've been very gracious. They did run a nursery so they understand rural business, um, but it's still just a nice thing to do to provide them with a little extra privacy. I'm thinking also of planting some salix um, along that fence line there. It's, it's pretty damp and they should grow well. So, but yeah, that's, that's what we've been up to and working on this fence and getting this put in and then back to more work in the orchard. Got uh, an order waiting for me up at the garage and there's another one on the way. Um, smaller orders, uh, we only have one big one left and one, I think one or two tiny ones and one medium sized one. Quite a few plants this year, for sure. And uh, a lot of this vacation has been spent dealing this time off that I've had with uh, getting mulch on the rows and creating mulch. So we haven't had as much with the, with uh, the economic slowdown we've been having. We haven't had as much activity of people bringing us material. Obviously they want to practice social distancing and we're outside and no reason why they can't dump off a load. But people just aren't traveling. So I get it. So that means we've had to make some more mulch of our own. The tree was one of those. I did some stuff over at um, my parents' place and brought back a load of mulch from there. And um, yeah, just where we're working on. The next 10 days minimum are supposed to be sunny here. And who knows, this Oregon, that could change, but that was the pattern last year was May was a dry month, a little bit earlier this year, April into May, but hopefully we get some more rain. I'm not ready for the rain to stop yet. The plants need more rain than that. But uh, yeah, beautiful day out. Hopefully you guys are staying safe and healthy and uh, hopefully we uh, are, are past this, this pandemic um, as a country soon. Certainly in our area, it has not been what they've said it would be and hopefully we can at least um, back off of the lockdown soon and you guys get to start seeing more family and traveling a little bit more and getting some more stuff done and get people back to work. All right, um, next time I think I'll talk a little bit more about the mulch and the orchard itself. Uh, I may give you one more video on the fence when it's finalized. 
we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, see how much time I, I have at each of those parts and pieces, but let me know if there's anything that you want to see. Uh, any more details of how I build a fence. Um, my fences are built to withstand goats, pigs, cows. Um, sheep aren't a problem if goats aren't a problem. Um, and uh, the, animals, the animals don't get out of any of the fences that I've built. Um, I've never had any problems with that. The electrical ones, every once in a while, the goats will test them. And they, sh they do. They test fences. They, they want to know, you know, is this still a thing? Oh, yeah, it's still a thing. Um, or, oh, hey, I can go right through here. So, uh, but they respect it once it's been established and you've trained them. As long as you maintain your lines, they, they really do respect it. Just don't bet your young succulent fruit trees on that fact. Always go for the overbuild. They're expensive investment either of time and a lot of grafting and uh, propagation or in straight orders. So good to keep that in mind. See you next time.